This is all brought to you by the Field of 68 Media Network, where you should like and subscribe and follow us if you'd like to get more content such as this. Myself representing the Creighton Blue Jays, as always, and a bunch of different of our different hosts hosting podcasts for their alma maters. Uh, you got guys representing Florida, representing North Carolina, uh, and all those big time schools that you hear about all the time. So make sure to follow the Field of 68 Media Network for all of that content. And also don't forget to download the Locker Room app. Uh, to get pre and post game uh, conversations with myself. And again, those same hosts who are, are hosting other podcasts, they'll be on there too. You can interact with us. You can ask live questions or you can request to speak and we can continue the conversation either for a free game show or for a post game show. Today on our 12th episode of the Welcome to the J podcast is a very special guest. He was a top 50 recruit coming out of Omaha North. After redshorting at Creighton, he won the Big East Freshman of the Year and was also named on the Big East Freshman team, as well as the second team, All Big East. He holds the Big East Freshman record for field goal percentage in league play. That year, he had 72 dunks, including 32 alley-oops in his lone season at the Hilltop. He was the 16th pick in the 2017 NBA draft. He recently signed a two-way contract with the Houston Rockets and last night had 4.6 rebounds three blocks in his debut he is the hometown kid another product of omaha justin Patton. welcome to the J, man welcome thank you for having me man man how you been how you holding up hey I've, I've been good but let me let me start by saying it's it's an honor to be on here i'm on the 12th one and <laughs> got hands man i got number 12 <laughs> the honorable number 12 so you know what i mean it's, Hell it's yeah. special, special. Bro, I've been waiting to get you on here, man. We've been trying to set this up for a while, so I'm so happy that you finally had a little bit of time to, like, step into the J with me. Man, let's talk, man. Let's talk about your whole career, obviously, where you got to, you know, where you're at now. Obviously, again, congratulations. I know it's, a, it's been a long, crazy journey for you so far. We definitely got to get into it. But congratulations on, obviously, signing that two-way contract. We all are wishing the best for you you know how jay's fans are they support you through and through especially being a hometown kid so once again congratulations thank you boss. Bro, i can't wait to see what you do with this opportunity so let's let's just go at it from the beginning uh playing at omaha north basically you're an unknown prospect for a little while and then you just kind of blow up the scene you end your senior season being a top 50 recruit how crazy was that transition from you like kind of not necessarily knowing where you where you stand and like with all the other prospects around the nation to all of a sudden you're a highly sought after guy um it, it was crazy but it, to be honest i was oblivious to anything as far as rankings as far as like you know the the superstardom i guess of, of anything any of the stars i was just oblivious to it all i was just a kid just having fun like you know just trying to be trying to be good at a sport and not get made fun of you know like as as we all mm-hmm. are we begin at doing something so like all the accolades and stuff just came along with just me working hard and just trying to be the best at at the sport and have fun with it i remember the first time i saw you was during one of those team camps uh, you came one year. I think you're only like about like six six at that point, having got to like that that seven foot frame that we obviously grew accustomed to seeing later on. The next summer, you come back and you're about like six eight six nine, running like a deer, jumping out the gym. And then Coach Mack, I was at the scores table. Coach Mack goes like, "Yeah, he's he's one of the guys that we really really want." <laughs> I was like, "I remember seeing this kid last year." Man. I mean, not that they didn't want you at that time, but it was necessarily that kind of noise. Uh, what do you remember about events like that, where like again, you go from like you're just playing, like you said, like not knowing exactly where you stand as far as other recruits are, and all of a sudden you hear all these whispers about these coaches, you know, wanting to uh, get to know you, wanting to see what the options would be for you to come to their schools. Bro, it was crazy because like the, I'm a, I'm from Omaha, right? So like in, I was watch I watch every single Creighton team. Um, so like guys like you, like Etchenique, hey, you got Z with the arm sleeve, you know what I mean, like. <laughs> like all the little shit like that that you only notice when you're somebody like me from Omaha and then you go into a gym mm-hmm. you guys and it's like like why wow, I'm in here and then at the same time it's like I gotta like I gotta I don't want to look bad you know what I mean like it's in any gym you right. go into you don't want to be the, the weak link so it's like all right let me just not be let me not make a mistake let me not trip on my face fall on my face so I just try to come in <laughs> I, I didn't even come in and do too good you know I just want to come in and like 
like not be noticed as far as like the bad guy. So it was crazy, man. And just being in those gyms, it 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 like brought things to reality for me in a sense that like like wow, I'm, like I'm like I can really be on this level. Never knowing what I can achieve as far as in the game itself, but just like like I'm here. Like this is I'm gonna go back after this. You guys are gonna go continue your season, but I'm going back to like my to my homeboys and my boys and and mm-hmm. and I'm gonna talk about this. Like and I may not ever come back crate again. So. I was just taking it in the moment. Speaking of, obviously, you ended up at Creighton. Um, I, I personally think it was the best decision you ever made in your life. I know it was for sure the best decision I've ever made. But what other schools were you looking at, obviously, once you gained a little bit of notoriety? So it's a funny story. Uh, well, Creighton, I was going to choose Creighton no matter what. Like, Creighton is, like, the mm-hmm. best thing. In, there's nothing better than Creighton. There, there's no other school better than Creighton. Like, I got a tattoo on my arm. Like, Hell yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's those things where it's like, no matter what, it's just, it's, 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 it's crazy to me. So like I was, uh, getting recruited and I was going hard and then I was getting like, I was five stars. And then I was a practice with OSA, my AAU team and, uh, coach, uh, Francis was telling me, obviously I was, I was already committed. I was committed early and he was just telling me that, uh, I had all these looks from these, I came in and practice bad. He was like, you think I'm, what am I supposed to tell Florida, Kentucky, uh, Texas A&M? And I'm, I'm looking like, yeah. I'm like, yo coach, I don't have any, like you didn't tell me about any of this stuff, but like yeah. I, I, I was getting calls from a lot of teams. And then even when I went to go work out this summer for teams, uh, team camp in Utah, t- like Tom Crean was there from Indiana. He was telling me, yeah, like we wanted to recruit you, but you know, we just heard you were off limits and rightfully so. Cause I was 10 toes down for crazy. and wasn't going to change my decision. Right. Easy money. You're a hometown kid. It kind of seems like a pretty easy decision up after that. Like, uh, like to me, if I was an Omaha homegrown, we talked about it with Josh Jones too. Like just the lore of playing in front of 18 thousands of people that, you know, people that you see out in the community, how is that feeling uh, for you being, you know, from there, understand that these are your people and they're always going to be cheering for you? Man, it's a lot of pressure. And it's, a, it's like a good pressure. Like, um, mm-hmm. like I come from like Omaha, you know, where it's geographically located. Like it's not in a great neighborhood and it's not the, mm-hmm. it's, it's not in the, like in a great place. And that's where I'm from, that place of um, poverty and that place of um, like just low income and stuff like that. So when I was there, I felt the pressure to, to, to represent, you know, to represent where I'm from. And there's a lot of different aspects of Omaha, that a lot of different places. So just to represent my part of town and um, how represent how strong we are, how resilient we are, and just and, and how fun we are. So those things were on my back every single day. And even when days when I wanted to quit, it was like I had too, too many people behind me to to, to not to, to, to stop. You know, I had people behind me, even if I felt bad, they would they would know. And just being that Omaha kid, they would know when I was off off a little bit, you know, a little down. So I was always I had that um foundation behind me to make sure I was always set. So it was a good pressure behind me, a good foundation that I had with the city behind me. So I, I was a lucky guy. So you commit to Crane. It's your first year on campus. Uh, you and the staff obviously come to a mutual decision to redshirt that year. Uh, I think you're going to end up playing behind Jeff Grossell and Zach Hansen, if I'm not mistaken, for that uh, redshirt. The year that you decided to redshirt, that was the centers that they had at that team. Talk about, uh, you know, obviously I know everybody wants to step in and they want to contribute right away, but talk about that redshirt year for you, the kind of things that you learned that helped you develop so you could, you know, hit the ground running that very next year. Bro, it was so tough. In the moment, you like, you never, you never know what's going on in the moment. Like you get, you got to experience stuff to have for, for you to understand stuff. So like, like you said, I was like six, 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 nine. So I'm thinking I'm coming in the crate. And I was, when you saw me, I was probably just running the floor, like getting dunks, um, like doing all little stuff, you know? So I never thought I was going to be a back to the basket five. So uh, when that conversation came and coach Max saw something that I didn't see, and that's one thing I would credit him uh, uh, like forever for is that he thought that I would be more valuable as a back to the basket five. So just putting on, he said, I just need to put on weight. And, and once I experimented in that position, I was going up against Jeff Russell, who I thought was an NBA all-star at the time. Like, he, I, was getting, <laughs> I was getting killed every single day in practice. You can ask anybody. Like, I almost wanted to go back. Hey, and- that's a question I wanted to ask you because, like, me and Isaiah, we talk about it often. Like, obviously, after we saw your development, we're like, damn, like, it's crazy to think in practice, like, Jeff, Zach was just backing him down into the basket and just – layups 
left, right, and center over you. So like, it's just so crazy that you just mentioned that out of nowhere. Cause I, I've heard the stories, like I didn't get the chance to watch those scenes practice, but I can only imagine what those guys used to do. Yeah. It was like the first three weeks was, uh, it was, it was like getting tortured. Um, and coach Mac was, you know, coach, <laughs> I was on the red team. So like, the white team never supposed to lose. So he would draw a play specifically for me to get pinned down in the paint by Jeff or Zach. And so Jeff can go yeah. over his right shoulder and get that hook. Or so so Zach can go over his left shoulder and get that hook. So I was getting tormented. But I, I figured out at a point that, like, what why I'm – I had to figure out why I'm here, you know. So I, like, looked at everything, looked at my, like, myself, and I realized that I'm faster. I realized that I can jump higher. I realized that I can shoot a little better. So – just using those strengths to my advantages and, uh, and it, it ended up working out in the long run. And obviously with the development of coach Bailey at the time, who his, his weightlifting scheme m- might be a little bit outdated to some, but to a, un- to a, a skinny guy like me, I needed that, that, that everyday lift that, um, that tenacity that he had in the weight room. So, and it helped me put on a lot of weight and helped me put on a lot of, uh, like help me get my movement. Right. So it was great. I remember when I come back in the summertime, one of Coach Bailey's proudest achievements was you uh, obviously putting some weight on and being able to keep it on. And then it was also Marcus Foster for bringing his body fat percentage down. So, yeah, shout out to Coach Bailey, because like even me, I came in as 165 soaking wet. <laughs> but by the end of my <laughs> freshman year, I was about like 175 and I kind of looked like a Division One athlete. So, yeah, man, Coach Bailey did wonders for guys like us, for sure. Man. Bro, you were... Honestly, uh, we had Marcus Foster on the podcast. Uh, I've said this often before, not only on this podcast, but like to a bunch of different people that I've had this conversation with. You were a part of a team that was literally my favorite team to watch as a fan. Uh, Obviously, I'm very biased with the teams that I played for. (laughs) I personally think those were the best teams ever. But like as a fan coming back and watching the team that you had with, you know, Marcus Foster, Maurice Watson, uh, Cole Huff, uh, Isaiah, yourself, obviously, uh, Kyrie, man, that was a team like you literally couldn't keep your eyes off the screen. Cause like I said, at any given point, some crazy could happen. I remember that game against Wisconsin, especially near the end. I think, uh, Kyrie got this or you got the steal and the dunk first and then Kyrie got a steal the very next position and then got the N one dunk. And then the crowd just went crazy. Uh, talk about that specific team that year. Uh, obviously things didn't end up the way that you wanted to with injuries and all that stuff coming about near the end of the season. But just talk about like the feeling of playing on such a, a team with such a great group of guys like that. Um, It was crazy. But even going back to um, my penny back up, what you said earlier, like our scout team, bro, like we were beaten like three weeks. Like after I was like the last piece of the puzzle when, on our scout team to like everybody to get developed, I guess. So after that, like four week window and they in that season, that team was playing. Our scout team, I would say, and you can quote me on this, like, we were better than the, the team that was out. <laughs> on like, the floor, yeah. Like, it was kind of <laughs> some days that we will like, we had to, like, kind of take it back a little bit just so, like, the, for the confidence part of everything. But, bro, it was mm-hmm. so fun just being in that in that environment of, like, every everybody's just wanting to be better. And, it, and it, in a moment, you don't really notice how good we are because like you're so competitive and like I'm going to my room every single day like damn I gotta be I gotta be better you know what I mean like Marcus mm-hmm. had 10 points eight blocks in practice today and coach Mack was patting his back and he had the food or whatever brought him up to the office and I'm walking mm-hmm. back to my room so just trying to it was a fight for that for that type of like uh pat on the back so in a moment you really don't really think about how good you are you're just really trying to be the best personally in in, in your spot so you can like bring that to the team but it was definitely like it was fun, and it was probably if I can like compare it to being like on a pro team like now it was probably it felt like like now it's like felt like a pro team looking back at it because everybody just mm-hmm. we didn't look, really look into anything that was going on personally, we just had uh, relied on the fact that everybody was going to do their job when they stepped in the court. It's just it's such a crazy team, like you said. Like it was definitely a pro team if you look at the pros that were actually on this team. Obviously, you reached the NBA level, but you got Marcus Foster, who just as recently as this year is in EuroLeague. Uh, shout out Watt for signing a contract. I think he's in Turkey now, if I'm not mistaken. Cole played overseas for a little while. Like, you guys really had some... Oh, Kyrie, obviously, and, and another yeah. NBA guy, another two, uh, two-way contract guy. So, like, you guys had some dogs on that team. So, like I said, like, that was just one of my favorite teams to watch. 
I want to talk about the connection that you had with Maurice Watson specifically. Like I said at the top of the intro, he basically was the guy who gave you those 32 alley-oops that season. Uh, he set you up beautifully and obviously helps you a ton with your development. When I think about guard and big connections uh, in the most recent history of Korean, I obviously think I think Grant Gibbs and Doug. I think right now, Marcus Zagorowski and Christian Bishop, who kind of look like what you guys used to do. And then obviously, uh, WAP and you. So kind of talk about WAP in particular and how he helped you with your development. Um, Bro, WAP was like a, a, a very key piece, like probably like the ultimate, like big brother to me in that whole process. And on the court, like without him, I wouldn't have been able to accomplish what I what I, what I was doing. Just just because what he saw and the things I couldn't see as like a, a big man just trying to like get dunks and just trying to like be a force. He was more like the thinker. Mm -hmm. And then for all of us, he, he would like be able to like think the game for us. And um, it would be like his Philly mentality that he brought to the team, like his his. You know what I'm saying? Like underdog mentality. He he represented our team that year. And like that we were we were a representation of him ultimately. And it was <clears throat> it was a lot of days where like some people will be, you know, like Creighton, we go we well, we go hard every day. So we have like little injuries, little this, that, and people not feeling well, but he'll be that guy that be like, yo, we got he will see the, the ultimate goal. So like he'll be like, yo, we gotta go, like <clears throat> we gotta get better today, we gotta practice, we gotta do this. And he came in every single day and he he made sure we battled and he brought that competitive edge. And also to me, like on days when I was getting bullied by Jeff or I was getting my confidence taken away, he would be the one right there, like where I can lean my shoulder on and tell me, yo, like what you doing? Like, why you got your head down? Like, like it's just you you're better than him, right? You're better than him. He's good right now. It's things like that to where he was just keeping me like level headed and keeping me optimistic about everything. And I can't thank him enough, man. Like like I tell it, like we still have this conversation to this day, like bro, like I wouldn't be here without you. You know what I mean? I feel like he has like a minority share in like my <laughs> in my success. <laughs> but bro, like, no, no, keep going. My bad. I thought you were done with that statement. No, but it, it's 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 great just to have him on my side, on my side, on our on our side as Jays. You know. Mm -hmm. I just want to talk about that team just a little bit more. I I felt like you and Wap were kind of like the meat and potatoes of the team. As far as like, you know, the first like 30 some minutes of the game, you guys really controlled it. Obviously, you could count on Kyrie's defense and all the intangibles that he brought. But like when the game push came to shove, you know, that ball is going to Marcus. Talk about he was on the podcast. We talked about it a little bit. But from your perspective, him being that kind of like a killer, especially down the stretch, a, a fearless guy, a fearless shot taker, fearless shot maker. Talk about that confidence that it gave that group of guys knowing, look, if the game is close, Marcus will just bring it home for us. Bro, it was, it was, it was crazy. Um, it was really uncharacteristic of Peyton to have somebody like that, you know, like to have somebody, mm -hmm. first of all, when he came on his visit, I'm like, wait, he's about to commit to Creighton. Like, you know, you, mean, <laughs> you get the guys like, it's like, like, like it's like the role player. They, and then they blossomed. He came in there and was like an NBA player. So it was like, all right, yeah, this this is going to be different. But just the, the stuff that he did every single day as that came to him naturally was just amazing. You know, the stuff that Coach Mack or, like, us couldn't even, like, fathom or teach or, you know what I mean? Like, we couldn't even, like, mm -hmm. like we couldn't even understand what was going on sometimes. And even, like, Marcus will come in some, some days quiet and do this, and Coach Mack will be trying to get on him, try to get his energy up. And But as soon as the bell will ring for practice to start or the game will start, like here is this NBA, like this NBA type jab, left uh, foot jab, go to the basket, like yeah. dunk, like you know what I mean. Like it was just a different type of talent that I haven't seen. And being a Creighton fan, I never saw like at Creighton, so I was just amazed every single time I see Marcus take the floor. You touched on this a little bit about the pressure of being the hometown kid, playing in front of your friends and your family, in front of eighteen thousand, uh, you know, native uh, people from Omaha, always cheering you on. Uh, Sharif Mitchell, uh, who's another Omaha kid right now, is kind of going through that. What is the kind of advice, obviously, looking back on it, uh, that you would give to a guy like Sharif or, you know, any Omaha kid who ends up being a Korean Blue Jay later in the future? Um, I would say the biggest thing is for, for him, like, he has to experience certain things, you know, to, to figure, like, figure things out. Like, I just had a kid recently, Kingston Nicholas Patton, um, and I was, and one of the things you like with having a kid is you don't want to like teach them everything. You know what I mean? You don't want to tell them about everything. You want to have them ex have those experiences themselves so they can understand it. 
Because, you know, if you would tell, tell somebody something, they won't understand. But the biggest thing I would tell him is just trust yourself and then remember where he comes from. Like, that statement is thrown out so many times, but if you actually just remember where you come from and remember how you were brought up, you won't ever forget what makes you happy. You won't ever forget what makes you go, what makes you, you know what I mean, what makes your engine go. So just, you know what I'm saying, remember where you come from. And that, that's what helped me. Like, like, I would go, although I wouldn't go home a lot, I would always remember what I'm working for. And if I was to slack off, what would I be walking back to? So just knowing that where I go in life, you know? Because we come from the, you. me and Sharif come from the same, Sharif and I come from the same place. So I know yeah. he wants herself and better her situation. And I know he's going to do that. He's doing a great job at attacking that situation. I spoke to Josh Jones about that too, obviously. And he was just like, bro, like it's just a different feeling understanding who you're trying to represent. I'm sure you had that feeling too. And, you know, it speaks volumes for you to say, you know, don't forget where you came from. Like you could be walking right back in that same environment if, you know, you don't take care of, you know, the due diligence that you have to take care of uh, in the present time. So like, it's crazy to think, obviously, like over the years, Crane's had so many Omaha kids come through the program. Like you guys really have your own kind of, you know, side brothers, brotherhood or whatever. Yeah. So how does it feel to kind of be an alumni of like an Omaha kid that actually went to Crane and like went through the ringer and came out on the on the other side as a better person? Um, it feels it feels good. And I feel like as a person in like in this in this um fraternity, I guess, within Creighton. It's like the job is never finished, you know, because we got guys like Sharif coming behind us and Sharif ha has guys who, you know, I don't want to throw anything out there. But, you know, we got prospects in Omaha who are top McDonald's All-Americans right now who may who have it in their choices to go. So just setting that example to um to to to, to make sure that people see it as a path and, and make sure it's realistic. You know, just, we like we've done it so you can do it, too. So just letting people know that it can happen and um, also just keeping that window and blazing that trail for those guys coming behind us. And that's what I feel like I need to do. And, and I feel forever indebted to Omaha in general and through through Creighton to make sure the opportunity is always there. Let's stick on that topic for a little bit, because obviously the growth of basketball in Omaha, in my opinion, has, it, like it's grown tremendously in the last decade or so. Uh, obviously not every kid ends up at Crane. Some kids end up, you know, all over the nation, but just kind of talk about your perspective of seeing the sport of basketball in and of itself growing in Omaha and growing in Nebraska in general. Um, I, I think it's amazing how, how much has grown. And I think that college, college sports have done a, a contributed a lot to that just because like you got people who graduate from Creighton and they play sports, they play basketball or whatever, or even women's basketball. And they, they're finished, they finish college. And then it's like the amount of love that they receive from the Creighton fan is a uh, it, 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 it they love it so much that they end up staying in Omaha and it just opens up another you know avenue for for players coming up in Omaha themselves for them to you know to talk to so like we have uh, Chevelle who's from around the area who has her uh, her her um, company she's running now I think it's like DL, DVLP something like that where this uh, about that development yeah I got you. Yeah. It's for like the yeah. exposure uh, for for people in the area, and then we also have Maurice who's back all the time and and doing things for Omaha, the kids in Omaha, and showing them that that there's opportunity. So, and then you like you come back for the camp sometimes, and you know you, mm -hmm. for those kids to see like us come back and and see that people are there and open up that avenue, it's just amazing, and um, it, it it's it's unexplainable what those, I can't imagine what those kids feel and I can't imagine the opportunity to see with seeing us there and, you know, helping them out. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about draft night, bro. Uh, obviously like the freshman retro freshman season didn't end up the way that you wanted to, you guys ended up losing to Rhode Island. You go through the whole draft process. You kind of dip your toe in the water at first. You weren't sure if you're going to go come back and then you make the decision to leave. You end up getting picked up number seventeenth uh, overall, if I'm not mistaken, right? Sixteenth. Um, hey, let me put some respect on your name. Sixteenth. That's on me. Hey, that's on me. Personal file number twelve, bro. <laughs> what was that feeling? Finally, you know, reaching your goal, achieving your goal of getting drafted into the NBA. Um, it was crazy, and I, and let me like uh, put this in there. I knew I was leaving as soon as Maurice got hurt. You know. Mm -hmm. 
just because you see the how things how fast things can change and you see how fast um like how how fast it can go like with injuries and stuff like that so i knew i was leaving um it was a matter of people like, like trying to convince me to come back at that point um but mm-hmm. it was it Draft night was a crazy, a crazy time. And one of my biggest regrets through this whole process, probably up until about two years ago, is I didn't really value how good it was I, in the moment. You know, I didn't really value where I was. I didn't really because I was getting I was there off natural given talent. I was there off of mm-hmm. having fun and, you know, just doing what I do. Like it wasn't really anything I had to put in extra time, like extra with. I like lo- I love basketball. I was obviously hooping a lot, but as far as like the being a professional thing goes, I never really learned that. So, um, like it was, it was, it was crazy draft night, but one of the biggest things I learned throughout the, like from that process is, um, like people came in more ready than me. Like people came in expecting like that they had to fight for certain things, had to grow up in certain ways. And I was just still the same college kid trying to have fun and still, you know, just hooping, having fun. Not really like not realizing how much work you had to put in. So would you say the business of basketball is something that you definitely had to learn as far as like, like you just said, like being a pro every day, showing up, fighting for your job? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, because once you, like, you know, like, if you, if I would have stayed there after, after like, uh, and that's why I realized that I probably wouldn't have been successful as like you would have been or anybody else would have been at Creighton just because I would have showed up that next year, that next summer and like expected, you know, my position and expected this, that and other. And um, that's how it, showed up at in the NBA like I expected certain things to happen just because of what I what I achieved and that's just you know that's not the case um and that's what I figured out you got to work for everything and and most times it's not even about talent it's about timing it's about punctuation and and and, and how you are as a human being off the court so those are things I have had to uh, grow up and realize you've had such a crazy start to your NBA career bro like from getting drafted to getting traded and getting traded again, a um, couple of different G League stints. Uh, and then now you finally worked your way back up. Uh, like I said, you had a game last night in the NBA. You're in Cleveland right now, uh, obviously playing the Cavaliers soon. So uh, what is it about this time around, having this opportunity uh, that is going to be different for Justin Patton? Um, just – uh, just pinning back in off of what I was talking, just worth ethic and, and realizing the little things that I have to do. Um, and, and it's shown like just in these last, in this last year, just doing little things, uh, getting sleep, uh, working out three times a day, getting my diet right. Um, and even like spiritually, you know, believing in something to where I don't have to rely, rely on anything that's, um, that, that has no substance. I can rely on things that have substance. Like, uh, I'm a big, like my faith has grown a lot. And even just reading and, and growing my mind is growing a lot. So things like that to where I can actually build substance within myself and have a foundation to fall on to where if anything goes wrong, you know, I can fall back on that foundation. So I need to ask you about this because I think you were in Minnesota uh, the time the infamous Jimmy Butler practice. I believe that you're on that team, bro. This is one of my favorite stories of all time in the NBA. Like, Lily, this is a top five story for me. So you were actually a part of that. I kind of want to know your perspective of what actually happened that day, what was going on. We heard the whole um, story about Jimmy Butler getting the practice players and beating the starting five or whatever. But I want to hear from your perspective since you were in the gym. <laughs> Bro, it was crazy. It might be saying too much, but you know, it's it's over and it's it's in the past. Hey, I I don't I don't need you to throw anybody in the, under the bus, bro. I just want to know like what you were thinking. Yeah, <laughs> bro, it was a crazy time. Um, like I, obviously I was one of those guys in that lower half, but I was injured at the time. And Jimmy, like mm-hmm. from the jump, like my first day in um uh, in Minnesota, he took me to dinner. Uh, he took me under his wing and he like had me as his little brother, and still to this day. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> when that's let's. All that stuff is happening. First of all, Jimmy, the media can be a uh, you're one of the good guys in media, and you I I, uh, I believe that you you will continue to be one of the good guys in the media, but the media can put put, put a put, uh, put a I don't know put a image on you that that's not you. Yeah, Jimmy every day was one of those guys who just wanted everybody to be better, and and he led by example. He will be there at five a.m. six a.m. Um, getting work in this that and other. He was a great guy, but. That starting off on that day, bro, we go into um, we go into practice and it's like a regular practice, but you know we've been losing a little bit and every, we know something's about to happen. And Jimmy just comes in and just says like, "Yo, we about to like, I'm about to, we about to play." 
um, y'all just y'all score. I mean, y'all score the baskets, and I'm gonna play, y'all y'all play hard, and I'm and I'm gonna, I'm gonna play hard too. I'm gonna lock up everybody up. But he literally guarded everybody and locked them up. And that that team, that green team, the third team, won every mm-hmm. single game. Other the most I think the other team scored was like going to eleven, probably scored like four or five. And he was just a dog. He didn't score at all. He didn't score one bucket. Like he was just locking uh-huh. everybody and talking, talking stuff. Like he and he was look. He was looking at me. I got my foot up on a chair. Like he was saying, <laughs> saying so, like, yeah, this is what I, this is what I fucking do. Like this is that, like, yeah, hey, yeah you, that's, you know, guys, like we want to see guys actually talk, talk. And he came in there and he did what he said he was gonna do. So it was amazing. Mm-hmm. It was one. Of, it was one of those things like when you watch like the Last Chance. For uh, what the Jordan documentary, it was one yeah. of those uh, feelings. Like when you look, when I look at that documentary and look at Jimmy and he, what he did, so it was crazy. It's crazy, like you mentioned, like the media could kind of put a spin on the person, and it's hard to like deviate from that. Obviously, Jimmy Butler has been one of those guys. Uh, I've heard it from you. I've heard it from Doug, because Doug was his team in Chicago too. And like you just said, like to this day, you guys obviously still talk every once in a while. Doug has the same thing to say about him. It's like once you're on Jimmy's good side, like like you guys are boys for life. Like he's good. He'll he'll invite you out to places. He'll take you out to eat, like he said. So, yeah, man, it, it's it's ridiculous sometimes. And I think, but now obviously with his final run last year with the Miami Heat, he's kind of being vindicated a little bit. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, one thing that people always love to see is uh, like people never believe anything in the moment, but I, he validated that by bringing his culture, like. Anytime when somebody steps up and, and tries to be something or they're standing on what they what they know, if new things are always like, hard to accept. But and mm-hmm. it's hard to accept in that situation. But he took that same mentality and he brought it to another situation and it worked. So I think that just validated a whole lot of things that he was uh, trying to get validated. So I think that worked out for him. And, and, and congratulations to Miami. I know everybody on that team loved Jimmy. I know that whole staff loved Jimmy and vice versa. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to take too much more of your time. We just got a couple more fan questions that we have to get to before I let you go, bro. First question is, do you still stay in touch with Omaha North? I, I know you do, but just kind of talk about some of the stuff that you do, obviously, not only for your old high school, but uh, how about for the community of Omaha as a whole? Uh, yeah, I, I'm in touch a lot. <clears throat> One of the biggest things that I'm planning on doing is just, like I said, just creating an opportunity for inner city kids and um, giving them that that's the things that I didn't have um, with Omaha North, I'm looking to do a lot of big things with like sponsorship things. Um, I was with Nike uh, and I was looking forward to doing some things with them with Omaha North, mm-hmm. but just getting wh- wh- whatever my next shoe contract is, getting them taken care of and making sure they have the right resources. And with any team, like it, or with Omaha, I know that kids want to play for the who has it. T- kids want to play for teams the, who have the, shot. the coolest gear. Yep. <laughs> like just bringing that to where I'm from. And so kids, so when you know the geographics of Omaha, like so kids don't have to go out west to get that. So just bringing all that shiny stuff to uh to North Omaha and make sure kids have that all that cool stuff down north. Second question from the fans: What are you most excited about being back in the NBA? Um, just to prove, show and prove. Uh, I think that I'm lucky to have the chance. Uh, I think that the biggest thing is just I wanted to show people how hard I work and, and and what I bring to the game of basketball and how my love can translate to what I can produce as far as uh, my effort and um, my IQ. Mm-hmm. And last but not least, your, either your favorite or your best dunk at Crane from what you remember. Um, There's a tie for two. Uh, I was the uh-huh. best comment in Kyrie. The, the, yep. that, <laughs> Hell yeah. That, was great and then in the bahamas uh, in the st thomas uh the one i came down maurice dropped like a pass to me and, and i came down lane i dunked uh-huh. it out it was some crazy stuff <laughs> <laughs> it was just the best just the whole dynamic of that trip was amazing <laughs> yeah uh, that's kind of something that i wanted to ask you too because like that's kind of when the the table kind of flipped for you like from what from what i was seeing as a fan after that thanksgiving tournament when you guys won uh like things just started clicking and that's when you started having like these big games i think you had a game against st john's like 25 and 12 or something like that like i was like man like he's really arrived so would you say like after that thanksgiving tournament like that camaraderie that you guys built winning that that it obviously really helped your game and brought it to the next level right yeah for sure we played a team uh old miss 
and they had some guys, man. And, and like we never, mm-hmm. I've never played against anybody like that. But they were had guys who NBA. We played against Dennis Smith, who was on the the mock draft or whatever. And you see him on yeah. YouTube, and, all, and we competed, and we and we beat them, and we beat them, like just relying on ourselves. So once we realized that if we could just rely on our on our game plan and rely on ourselves and not be outside ourselves, we can win a lot of games. We we just continued to be ourselves, and we won. And last word uh, before you get out of here, uh, what would you say to this year's Crane team? Obviously, we know the history of Crane. We've never made it past the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. What would you say to this team, either as advice or, you know, whatever it is that you would say to those guys to give them some motivation to, to carry on and, and make history this year? I would say just be resilient and, and always know that only the, those guys in that room make each other better. So be on each other every single day to be the best. Whether it's like any adversity between each other builds, it makes things better. Like it, you never go back from adversity. You know what I'm saying you get better from adversity. So just uh, challenging each other every single day and being resilient through everything. JP, my brother, man, I appreciate you spending a little bit of time with me in the J, man. Everybody that's out there, make sure you like and subscribe to the Field of 68 Media Network. Make sure you download that Locker Room app. JP, we'll have to catch up in person soon, bro. Stay safe. Love you, bro. Congratulations. Love you too, bro. Go get it, man. You already know what it is. Thanks for having me, man.